If you have your Bible with you this morning, turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. We are continuing our uh, Roman series this morning, but we come to a section of Scripture at the end of Romans 5, which is, I mean, it's a grizzly bear. It's, it is deep, it is theological, and uh, next week we will pick it up again with verse 12. It says, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people. And so that's where we're headed. This idea that sin entered the world through this one man, Adam, and by that death entered the world. But as I dug deeper into chapter five, what I realized is, is that we can't really have a good understanding of Romans five if we don't have a good understanding of Genesis three. For us to really wrestle next week, and it will be a wrestle next week, but for us to wrestle with Romans chapter five, and to fully understand what Paul is trying to communicate to us about sin entering the world and grace as a response to sin, we're going to go back this morning to Genesis 3 and look at what has been called the saddest event in history. John MacArthur said this, all problems, personal and environmental, all that is wrong, evil, immoral, incomplete, all that is decaying, inferior, failure, disappointment, all weakness, sadness, sorrow, and pain, all disillusion, trouble, discomfort, and remorse, all regret, conflict, hate, jealousy, and envy, all bitterness, vengeance, fear, crime, and selfishness, all confusion, lies, deception, error, intimidation, manipulation, deviation, distortion, everything that fails to be as perfect as God came from this one event. It is monumental. It defines the universe as we know it. It is the reason for imperfection and death. And for us to really understand the depth of grace and how Jesus is the new and better Adam, we go back this morning to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now, little recap of the first two chapters of Genesis. God made everything and it was good. And in that we learn that he was, or he is, omnipotent, eternal, that he brings order to chaos. And then God made us, and he said that was very good. And he made us for relationship with him and each other. He made us for a purpose. He gave us free will. And as man and woman are living there in the garden, God took Adam, put him in the garden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will surely die. Now that's pretty clear, right? I mean, there's not a lot of amb ambiguity there. Eat any tree you want, except this one. And if you do, you will certainly die. Not maybe die. Not there's a chance you'll die, certainly die. One translation translates that Hebrew, dying you will die. Basically, he's like your earthly life will end and your eternal life will end. But Adam doesn't have to worry about that because he's trusting God and now God's given him a helpmate and it's all good and there are living with God daily in relationship. There's no shame. There's no guilt. There's no sin. That's his reality, and it is awesome. Nothing could be better than what he was living. And then chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. Now, we don't fully know here whether Satan like possessed a serpent or he took the appearance of a serpent 
or he tricked him to believe he was the serpent. Like we're just, we're not exactly sure how all this came about, just that it seemed that she was talking to a serpent. And the serpent is an image for Satan that we find throughout scripture in Revelation 12, he's referred to as the ancient serpent in Revelation 20, also referred to as the ancient serpent. So this idea has carried over. And the Bible goes out of the way to say the serpent was crafty, that Satan was smart, devious. And he approaches Eve and, and I don't, like people have asked me like, was this common practice that even Adam talked to the animals? I don't, I don't know, right? But certainly in this case, here is Eve talking to the serpent who's talking to her and says, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The first step of sin, the first indicator of sin is when Satan tries to cast doubt on God's word. Did God really say that? I mean, are you certain? Maybe he meant something else. Now, remember, we just clarified. He didn't mean anything else, right? It wasn't an ambiguous, it wasn't a 12-page contract with fine print and section four loophole E, right? Don't eat the tree. If you eat the tree, you will die. Will I die? You will certainly die. But all it took to bring some confusion was Eve saying, or was the serpent saying to Eve, are you sure? Are you sure that's what God said? Maybe he didn't actually mean it. Maybe, maybe you misheard, which is why it's so important that we know what God says, right? That we are consistently in the word because God is truth. He gives us truth and he says, this is the way to blessing and this is the way to curses. This is the way to life eternal. This is the way to destruction. Like it's very clear. And as I've said hundreds of times in 12 years, and I'll say it again this morning. Satan does not come at us and say, God is wrong. You should believe the opposite of God. He gives us something that's close to God, but is not real. Which is why we, we have these churchy phrases like the Lord helps those who help themselves. When God closes a door, he opens a window. And people believe those are words from God. None of those are in scripture. But because they believe that they're from God, because they've heard church people say them so much that they just assume that it's biblical, that when they do get more than they can handle, well, now they doubt God. When the door closes and no window opens, and people get frustrated and angry and like, God, you told me if you closed this door, you would open a window. And God's like, I never said that. But then we look at God and we say, why are you doing this? You must not be real because you're not opening any windows. It's the exact same trick. to get us to believe a version of God that is not really God. Now, this is super important, okay? If we are believing in something that is not 100% God, it is 100% not God. Well, I mean, 95% of what I believe is true, but this 5% over here is a little hazy. Well, then you're 100% believing in the wrong God. We have to believe in the God of Scripture, the God of truth. Think about when Jesus was tempted. You know, he'd been in the wilderness 40 days and then Satan appears to him and tempts him. Think, you know, aren't you hungry? Scripture says, you can just make the rocks turn into bread. 
Don't you want everybody just to fall at your feet and worship you? Just, just tell them. You could throw yourself off this building and the angels would catch you, right? That's what scripture says. It's close to what scripture said. But every time Jesus answered with the truth of scripture. And so this could have been the shortest story and the Bible would be this thick. And Adam and Eve said, no, God said eat the tree and die. I'm not going to. And that's the only story we'd have and we'd all be walking around a garden naked talking to animals, right? Like, but there would be no shame, no guilt, no sin. But the confusion, is that what God really said? And Eve says, well, God did say we could, we could eat from any tree in the garden. That's true. But, and God did say, you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden or you must not touch it. Wait, did God ever say don't touch the tree? No. It, isn't it amazing? It sounds like something God would say. But he didn't say it. Isn't it amazing how we just start to believe? The, the chain of separation here is God to Adam, Adam shares it with Eve, Eve talks to the serpent, now all of a sudden she's believing things that are rules that aren't rules. Or you may, or you will die. This translation in the NIV, uh, your translation might be a little different. Most translate that, you may die. So that even by this point, she's like, I might die. I mean, that might be what God does. That's not what he said. He said, you will die. How, how will you die? Certainly. That's all it takes. You won't die. The serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So, once a little bit of confusion comes in, well, then here comes doubt. Here comes distraction. You know, God's holding out on you. He doesn't want you to be as happy as you can be. He doesn't want you to get to experience all the fun things that happen in this world. I mean, God just wants to keep you under his thumb. That was the lie. It's the same one we believe. Oh, this over here will make me happy and God can't give me that. This over here will give me peace and God's not giving it to me. It's the same story. It just keeps happening over and over and over again. We forget the truth of God's word and then we begin to look at something else as if it is God. And what Satan got Eve to do here is to think this tree somehow is more important than God. And people have asked me before, well, then why did God put the tree there? Like, well, because he put the tree there because it also represented his sovereignty. It reminded Adam and Eve that they were the creation, not the creator. It kept their relationship in proper perspective. That's all God wanted. Once that idea gets in her head that there might be something more, she looked at the tree differently. She had seen that tree every day of her life. But now it looks different. Now the fruit look good for food. Now, never mind the fact that everywhere around her, there were beautiful trees full of good fruit, right? Like everywhere, God provided the, the best for them. She had never wanted for anything. But now that tree looks different. Now it looks like it's better. And it was also desirable for gaining wisdom well, up until this point, she thought she had all the wisdom she needed. 
Why now all of a sudden? Because the doubt creeps in. She was satisfied until she wasn't. She was surrounded by beautiful things all around her, but now that tree is more beautiful than anything. All around us is God's goodness and we take our eyes off of that and put it on the one thing that he says will hurt you. And we do it all the time. Now again, Satan didn't say, don't listen to God. He's wrong. You don't want any part of God. We wouldn't fall for that. Hey, God's holding out on you. Oh, God's great. Don't get me wrong. God's great. He's a great guy. He's done good work here. Look at how pretty the garden is. But why wouldn't he give you what your heart desires? And so she took it and she ate it. And she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. One of those questions that um, I'd like to ask God when I get to heaven, but I'll forget as soon as I see Jesus because he'll be better than the answers to these questions anyway, is how did that last sentence go? What was that conversation like? Because it kind of reads to me like she was like, hey, I ate some of the, the tree of uh, knowledge of good and evil. You want some? Sure. <laughs> I, I don't know that, but that's kind of how it reads to me. Like he was like, all right. Either way, they both eat. And as soon as they do, the entire world changes. And things that they had never experienced before, like shame. The eyes of both of them were open and they realized they were naked. And so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Confusion. Oh, I never noticed that before. What are we going to do? Well, I guess we'll sew some fig leaves together, right? Confusion and shame because God is walking in the garden in the cool of the day and they hide from him. They knew. They knew what they had done was the opposite of what God did. And so now you've got confusion and shame and fear because God calls out to them, where are you? And Adam says, I heard you, and I, but I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. I don't think he was afraid because he was naked. Because he wasn't naked anymore. Confusion. They'd never experienced it. Shame. Fear. <laughs> Blame enters the world. Who told you that you were naked, God said. Did you eat from the tree? By the way, God knew that they ate from the tree. Right? Right? It wasn't like God was, did you? No, he knew. Did you eat from the tree? And what, is she, what does he say? <laughs> the woman you put here with me. I can't even say her name. That, that woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit and I ate it. Blame, never in the world before this moment. God looks to Eve and says, did you do that? And he's like, snake. Snake did it. All those things that they had never had to experience and would not have had to experience. Enter the world because they saw something that they were convinced would be better than what God had for them. And they chased after it. And guess what? When you catch it, it will destroy you. Every time. The Lord made garments of skin for Adam and his wife. And he clothed them. And you can see, we don't have time this morning to read it all, but after confusion and shame and fear and blame came pain, came hard work with little reward, came hatred, 
came enemies, came war, all of this was the natural repercussion. And then in verse 22, the, the man has now become like one of us knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and, eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. And so after all of those other things enter the world, maybe the worst of all, separation from God. Just a few verses ago, God was in the habit of walking in the garden in the cool of the day. You know that, that time kind of sunset when the breeze kicks in and you can feel night coming but there's still daylight? They were in the habit of walking through the beauty of the garden side by side with God in the most perfect time of day. And one bit of confusion that leads to doubt, that leads to chasing after something that isn't God now has created a separation that they cannot overcome. And that's where Paul picks up the story next week. And he's assuming that we have a full and deep understanding of what actually happened in the garden. Because he's gonna say sin entered the world through one man and now grace is entering the world through the new and better Adam. And it would be really easy for us to say what people have said for generations, which is that wasn't my fault. Adam did that. I wasn't there. I didn't do it. Why does what Adam did in a garden mean separation from me, for me from God? And what I want us to see and lock in on before we dig really deep next week is this point, is that as you look at the story of Adam, see your own life. Because every sin that we have chosen is that story played out again. I don't listen to the truth of God's word. I'm distracted by something that promises me something better than God can deliver. I forget what God said and chase after that thing. And when I catch it, like a snake, it'll turn right around and bite me. That is the story not just of Adam, but of man, of me and you. And I may not have been in the garden, but I'm just as complicit because that's my story too. Now, the, the beauty of what Paul's gonna dig in next week is that as sin entered through one man, so too grace enters through one man. And that is the hope that we have this morning in Jesus Christ. That even though I have done the very thing that should banish me from the presence of God, there's no flaming sword keeping me from him anymore. There's no chasm so great that I cannot cross it because Jesus crossed it for me. And that's really where we'll focus next week. But to understand the depth of grace, we must understand the depth of sin. And so I, I think the takeaway for today as we prepare for Romans 5 next week is this. Do you see the pattern in your own life? The same one here that Paul's gonna reference next week because that's what Jesus died for. I am just as guilty as Adam, but I am just as forgiven because of the hope of Jesus Christ.